Right, so simply put, a tree is a connected, undirected graph with no circuits. Right, an equivalent statement to this is saying that a tree is a graph with one unique simple path between any two nodes. Oops. Right, we should qualify that with simple to indicate that there's no cycles, one unique simple path between any two nodes. All right. All right, so this is the basic definition of a tree. It's an example of a tree. And again, using our, our graph illustration here. It would be a graph such as this. Note that this is a graph, right? It's undirected, it is connected, right? And there are no circles, there are no cycles, no circuits. Again, also notes, using our equivalent statement, this is a graph with one unique simple path between any two nodes. That is, if you were to pick any two nodes, there is one way to get to those two nodes on a simple path without cycling or backtracking. Thanks. Another good tree example. Be this. Again, we have the same results. There are no cycles, it is connected. Right? Another way of saying that there is a unique path between any two nodes, unique simple path between any two nodes on this graph. So it is a tree. Right? Very often when, when we use trees, right, as a data structure or as to organize mathematical structures, we are interested in a particular type of tree. Right? One, of, one very common type of tree that is used a lot is a rooted tree. We'll define a rooted tree. Right. A rooted tree is simply a tree in which one vertex has been designated as the root. Once a vertex has been designated as a root, it gives us sort of a, an orientation to the tree. The root is considered the top of the tree, starting point of the tree, you know, whatever you're using the tree for. It's a node of interest at the very least, right? And so we will go ahead and introduce this concept with an example, and then we'll introduce a lot of nomenclature, right? As in order to speak about trees and rooted trees in particular, right, it's best if we get some of the basic nomenclature and vocabulary down. And so we'll go ahead and do this now with an example. And generally, when illustrating a rooted tree, the root of the tree is on top. Right? This is the node at the very top portion of the diagram, though not necessarily. Right. And so given that this, this node is at the top, in a sense, implies that this is the root of the tree. Right. In a sense, this looks like a tree, just sort of upside down. Right. This is the roof of the, the the root of the tree, sort of the base of the tree. Right. 
and a good example of of a rooted tree would be like a fire file hierarchy right our file directory right the root directory would be right the base of your file hierarchy right in unix systems we call this the root directory for a reason it is the root of this tree the root of this file hierarchy right in a windows machine this you might consider the c drive to be the root or or one of your main drives to be one of the root directories right and then under this you might have a directory such as and what do you have? Program files. All right, and then here you might have documents. All right, and so on and so forth. All right, so a file hierarchy is a good example of a tree. Um, nowadays, file hierarchies allow you to insert links so you can actually produce a cycle or a loop in this. So technically speaking, it might not necessarily be a tree, but more a graph. Right? But in its purest sense, a file hierarchy is a tree. Right, so let's just come back from that example and introduce the nomenclature now for a rooted tree. All right, so we'll introduce the idea of a parent node and child nodes. All right, before we do that, note that although we've defined a tree such that the edges are undirected, we defined it as an undirected graph, right? In a sense, once we identify the root, our tree has orientation now, and so our edges Right, can be seen as going away from the root or going toward the root. Right? They're either one or the other. So in a sense, our edges have direction. In most, right, um, in, as by standard, most consider the edges to be going away from the root. Right? Although we consider these to be undirected graphs, whenever we think of the orientation of, of a tree, we see the edges going away from the root. And so we'll use this concept to help better define some of our nodes, such as parent nodes and, and children nodes. Right? So we'll say, Right. Let's say let let node P and node C be adjacent nodes right in our tree in a tree. Right. Where the edge right goes from P to C, right away from the root, right again with this direction we'll say away from the root. Then P is the parent of C. And C, the child of P. All right, so I'll go ahead and fill in names for our nodes here. All right, so what does this mean? Well, if two nodes are adjacent, right, such as B and D, right, and the edge that connects them goes from B to D, then B is the parent of D, and D is the child of B. Right, so in this particular graph, B is the parent of D. A is the parent of B. C is the parent of G. H is the parent of I, right, and so on. And similarly, we can say that I is the child of H. H is the child of C. C is the child of A. D is the child of B, and so on. And so this is how parent nodes and children nodes are defined. And again, we'll keep this up here and introduce a few more concepts.
and a sibling. Sibling nodes and share the same parent. And so, for example, in this particular graph, D, E, and F are siblings. Sorry about that. I'm spelling here. A few more terms. An ancestor. A node n. Right, are all nodes that lie on the path between n and the root. And again, we'll say simple path. Right, so for example, B and A are the ancestors of D. And so here is D. B and A are the ancestors of D as they both lie on the path from D to the root. Right, A is the ancestor of all roots or of all nodes, right, by definition. And similarly, we can define descendants Right, the descendants of a node n right, are all nodes in the tree, and we'll say subtree, rooted at n. Right, so all of the descendants of C, for example, right, include all of the nodes in the subtree that is rooted at C. And lastly, we'll just define leaf nodes. So as we can view this tree as, a, uh, as an inverted tree, right, where our root is at the top, the leaf nodes are at the bottom of our tree, in a sense. Yes? Yeah, yeah this here. So this is the subtree rooted at C. Right? So every node on this tree, save C, is a descendant of C. The leaf nodes right, are nodes with no children. Right, so for example, D right, is a leaf node, E is a leaf node, F is a leaf node, G is a leaf node, and I is a leaf node. Right, as each of these nodes have no have no children. And again, viewing this as an upside down tree, 
right? Our root is at the top, the leaves, in a sense, are at the bottom. And also, while we still have this illustration of a tree up here, oops, we lost one of the notes, that's all right. And we'll state a fact about trees. Given our definition of a tree, if we have a tree with n nodes, right, then it must have n minus 1 edges. And if there were to be any more edges, we would have a cycle. By definition, right? In which case, it would no longer be a tree. All right. We'll introduce a few more terms here, and then we'll look at some examples of where and how trees are used. Right? And then we'll look at tree traversals. Right? How to traverse trees. All right. All right, so we'll define an m airy tree as a tree, a rooted tree, where every node has at most m children nodes. And right, so that's just an m, right? It seems to be a number, dash, and then airy, an m airy tree. It's a rooted tree. Each node has at most m children. Right. Thus, right, a binary tree. And also, it right, we could call a two area tree. Right, is a tree it's a rooted tree with the most two nodes, two children nodes. A rooted tree. And where each node has at most two children. All right, binary trees are used quite a bit in computer science. As our MRA trees in general. Right, so let's look at one way that we can use right, a binary tree in particular. First, we'll look at examples of MRA trees and then we'll do some examples with applications. Right, so here's an example of a three area tree. Right, in this particular example, right, we have a rooted tree. Again, here we'll assume this is the root, given the way that it's been illustrated. And so we have a rooted tree where each node in this tree has at most three children. Right, we'll take a look at a binary tree. Yeah. So in this case, would a binary tree also be a tree area? at most three? So in this, an example here of a two-area tree. Right, 
And again, here we have a rooted tree, again, implied given our orientation of the tree, where each node has at most two children. All right, so some examples of where we use trees. Again, just as with graphs, we can use trees as data structures themselves or to help organize a process or a procedure. In fact, we've seen procedures that have that take the form very similar to this, right? In fact, some of our recursive procedures, in a sense, right, had, had a characteristic where they would you know, branch out, right, uh, especially our non-tail recursion, and would form this tree-like structure. Another instance, right, another important application of trees are binary search trees. And here we'll just informally introduce this idea via an example. And assume rather than storing data, let's just use numbers in this example, in arrays or in a list, right, we could store them into a tree structure and organize the data. Right, in a sense, sort or keep the data in some sort of orderly fashion. Right, so here the nodes would represent slots in an array or buckets in a vector. Right, but we'll in insert items into this tree right, with the special caveat. Right, where each node, right, right, if we split up our, our binary tree here, right, we'll define, first we should define for our binary trees, right, our left child, right, and our right child. And since in a binary tree we have the two children Right, we generally designate one as the left child and one as the right child. Right, so three, right, the node that stores the value three here, right, we'll call the left child of five, right, and ten is the right child of five. All right, so how can we use binary search trees? Right, well, if we always insert an element. Right, such that the element we're inserting, if the element is less than a particular node, right, we'll put it somewhere along the path of its left child. And if the item is greater than a particular node, we'll always insert it in the tree somewhere along the path of its right child. Right? And then we can reduce the amount of time it takes to find the particular item. Right. For example, let's say that we had all of these items in a list and we wanted to search this list for one of the items. Right. What would be the time complexity of finding the item that we were looking for? If our list was of size n, it would be worst case scenario, big O of n. Right? We'd have to search every item in the list. Right now, let's look at this example here with a binary tree. Let's say we were searching for the item number four. How long will it take us to find number four? Well, given that we have these nodes here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven nodes. Right? The worst case scenario for finding an item in this particular tree, with a few assumptions, right, is actually going to be log n, log base to event. Why? Well, if we organize this tree, right, such that we insert the items based on order, as I initially noted, right, we can start at the root, right, and continue the search as follows. If the item we're looking for is less than the value stored in this particular node, we'll take the path of the left child. If the value we're looking for is greater than the value stored at this node, we'll take the path of the right child. And since we know that four, is less than five, we can go along the path of the right child, or the left child, excuse me. Again, when we encounter this node here, right, we can look at this node and say, all right, is four less than or greater than three? We know that four is greater than three, so we will take the path of the right child. Right, as soon as we hit a leaf node, right, our searching will stop. Right, if we found the item we're looking for, Great, we found it. If not, then the item is not in the list, right? Given these, given this scenario, right? So note here, given this particular tree, right? It's always going to take us. We'll only have to inspect three nodes at most, starting at the root node, 
to find the item we're looking for, rather than the entire list, which has seven nodes. Any questions about that? Actually, let's keep this up here for a minute. We'll look at the time complexity here. So why is that time complexity? Log base two of n. First, we'll discuss the height of a tree. So the height of the tree right, is the length of the path is the length is the length, excuse me, of the longest path, the longest simple path from a root node to any leaf node. Right, so the height of this tree is, right, we'll say two or three. Sometimes people will count the root node as starting at one, right, and you're counting the node down, or if you're just counting the edges down, it would be two. Right, so since here we've defined it to be the length of the path, we'll say the height of this tree is two. Right, note that the number of operations, the number of comparisons we'll have to perform when searching a binary tree is equal to the number of edges we're going to traverse or the number of nodes we're going to traverse. Right, we start at the root node and we're working our way to a leaf node. We're going to take the path of the left child, the right child, each time we're faced with a decision. Right, note that every single time we make a decision, for example, when we go down a left path here, we're eliminating half of the tree. So we, half of this tree we no longer have to inspect. Right. Each time we make a decision, we eliminate half again, half again, half again. And right. so rather than, in a sense, doubling and doubling and doubling every single iteration, we're halving and halving and halving iteration. The inverse of the exponential function is the logarithmic function. And so if we have a, a tree with n nodes, right, we'll have height. Right, of log base two of n. Right. If the tree is balanced. Right. 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 We should, of course, this is base two because we have a binary tree. So a binary tree with n nodes will have a height of log base two of n if the tree is balanced. And here we'll simply define a balanced tree. As a tree with minimal height. Right, so this is pretty, uh, pretty important and pretty impressive here as we're able to reduce quite significantly the search time right, of data right, if we're performing a, performing a search quite significantly when compared to an array. Right, we were also able to do this using a hash structure, right, a hash function and a hash table. Right, so using binary search right, and binary search trees is a great way to efficiently store data and efficient way to retrieve data as are hashes and hash tables. Another common use for trees would be 
uh, decision tree. How many of you have heard of decision trees before? Some, yeah. Decision trees, right? a, a fun application of a decision tree is a game tree. Right in these areas, in these applications, we use trees to organize a procedure or a sequence of decisions for a decision making process. And so in a game tree, right, the root node might be the initial state of a game, for example. Right? A, a simple game, that, a good example would be tic-tac-toe. Right? When we start a tic-tac-toe game, the tic-tac-toe the tic -tac -toe board is empty. Right? And then we're faced with the decision. Right? We have the first player has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine decisions to make. They can put their X or their zero right? in one of nine spots. Right? So each of these decisions can be seen as a branch. where one of these decisions would be to place the X, let's say, in the first spot. And one of these decisions would be to place the X in the second spot, right? And so on and so forth. We could enumerate out and organize using this tree all the possible decisions we can make at each stage of the game. Right? Similarly, from each one of these children nodes, we can branch off and assume what the opponent will do. Right? And so, for example, if the first player put the X here, right, this next branch, this next decision might be that the opponent places the O in that first spot available. Right. This one here might be that the opponent puts the, their O in, in that next spot over here, right, and so on and so forth. And then all possible combinations, right, all possible decisions that anyone could make, the player or the opponent, Right, at any stage of this decision-making process. Right, many decision-making processes are automated and the organization, the facilitation of this automatic decision-making process is done via trees and search trees. Right, in fact, there is a famous, well very recently there's now a, I think Google has a Go player, right, but more, you know, older, maybe 20, 15 years ago, there was Deep Blue. How many of you have heard of Deep Blue before? Deep Blue, right. The uh, chess playing game, right? Deep Blue, of course, used a search tree, right? Each one of these states was not a tic-tac-toe board, but rather the state of a chess game, right? Where all, all the different configurations of chess, uh, the chess players. And of course, the root of this tree would be just where all the starting points of all the, the game tokens on the chess board. And then you would have all the branches, all the possible moves that anyone can make given the state of the chess board at that state. There's a lot more decisions to make in chess than there are in tic-tac-toe. So this tree is very large. So Deep Blue, even though Deep Blue is a very fast computer, right, could never search this entire tree because the tree is very large. So Deep Blue used a various combinations of traversal and searching algorithms that limited its depth so, because it couldn't just keep going down the tree because the number of nodes grows exponentially by quite a bit. Um, every single depth, every single level down the tree, Deep Blue gets. Right, but uh, I guess the IBM, IBM. I think the IBM researchers said that it was some. It was a combination of a depth first search and a breadth first search, right? Which went down about seven levels into the tree max. And so they had to limit that uh, search, of course. Right. I think very recently there was an article in Science. I believe many people argued that the game Go. How many of you are familiar with the game Go? It's, and so Go is uh, a game that has many, many, many more states than chess. And chess was considered to be a pretty difficult game. And it was very, you know, it was, everyone was very excited when they came up with a computer algorithm that actually beat the grandmaster of the time, right, Deep Blue, he beat the grandmaster of the time. Uh, uh, but then uh, they, very recently, Go was created, what, 10, 20 years ago? Even less, more, not sure. More, okay, so it's an older game? It's an old, it's a very old game? Okay, it just, I guess in the computer science world, it, it came into, uh, into light very recently. Uh, and many scientists argued that you know, it would be a very long time or they would never develop a computer algorithm to be the human at this game because the state space, the number of states is so large, right? However, very recently, uh, I think Google developed, right? Uh, designed an algorithm which, which beats one of the best players of, of the day currently. All right, so, all right, so again, this was uh, very likely organized. I haven't read the, the paper yet, but I imagine they use some sort of version of, of a uh, sparse representation of a tree and a tree traversal. Right. 
for, uh, for that uh, algorithm. All right, so many fun uses of trees, All right? Right, and so this is a good segue into tree traversals. We'll go over tree traversal very quickly. We'll look at a depth first search. Right, and a depth first search just very informally proceeds as follows. We have a binary tree. Most tree traversals will start at the root, of course. Right? And then in a depth first search, you will proceed down the tree, favoring depth over the breadth or going across the tree. Right? Generally, we'll traverse from left to right in an illustrative fashion and going down the tree. So we'll start at the root and then go down. Right? And then go down right? again to the left. And we keep going down until we hit a leaf node. Right? As soon as you hit a leaf node, you can't go down anymore. Right? In which case, you will call it, it's called backtracking. Right? As soon as you backtrack, then you look to see if you can go down again. If you can, then you do go down again. And here we go down. Right? If there were more nodes down here, then we would go down again. Again, here we would have to backtrack. Go down, backtrack, backtrack, backtrack. Right? We can write a procedure to do this very, very simply. Right? So this is depth first search for a binary tree. So we just, inside of our tree here, or inside of our procedure, depth first search, we call depth first search. Of the left child of N. And depth first search of the right child of N. All right, we can encapsulate this in a conditional if in is not null, and this will allow us to, to break if there's no. All right, so again here we see that we just simply follow the left node, left node, left node down. As soon as we hit a leaf node, we'll skip over this, we'll return back up. Right after we return back up into the calling scope, we'll then follow down the path to the right node and then start our descent again by right, continuing in that fashion. Yeah, for this one, since uh, right now, so this particular depth first search is binary trees. We can generalize this. Right, we can generalize this to um, to accommodate trees with multiple children nodes by simply looping through the number of nodes or looping through the number of children rather than just designating left and right. Here, here we just have the two. Right, in the general case, we would simply iterate over each of the children. Right, within the scheme of depth first search, right, there are three very common ways to visit the nodes right, along this depth first search. Right, so this is in order. Traversals right, versus pre-order traversals. versus post-order traversals. And you guys have some homework questions related to these traversals. And so we'll, we'll briefly go over them here. Again, these are just variations on a depth first search. And they are each a depth first search, but then you quote unquote visit the node at different stages of the search. And so here, just to generalize it, here we will, again, just write out our pseudocode for Depth first search. And so in here again, we'll just say if in is not null. The DFS here, left node, a left child of n, that is, of course, DFS. 
right child and Here I'll just put comments to indicate if you want to do computations or, or printing or whatever visiting you're going to be doing at that note, right? You would put it here if it was going to be pre-order. We put it here if it was going to be in order. Right, so you put it here if it was going to be post-order. And so in your homework, and I think the simple example is, you know, visiting each node would be printing out the value at each node, right? If you had print statements here for the pre-order, or print statement here, if it was in order, or print statement here, if it was post-order, right? What would the print statement look like for a particular tree? Right? I encourage you to, to trace out an example using pseudocode for each. Right, based on where the where the visiting code is located, whether it's at for the recursion, in between the recursions, right, or after both recursion, right, the order of of the visitation will change fairly significantly. Right, as you'll see right in your homework. Or your suggested, not homework, but suggested practice problems. All right, and I think that that will do it for trees, as that gets us through the basics, right? You guys have a basic idea of trees, the Mary trees, height of trees, and a lot of the nomenclature, parent, children, ancestors, descendants. We talked about a number of applications, some really cool applications of trees, right? And traversal schemes for trees. Right, for those of you who are continuing on in computer science track, you will most surely revisit trees when you get to data structures. All right, so now we'll dedicate the rest of our class to reviewing exam three. All right, feel free to ask questions as we go along. And so we will certainly be covering, right, we have counting. All right, basics of combinations and permutations, right? But more importantly, it's important to understand, you know, the very basics, right? Our product rule, the idea of partitioning a sequence, right? And the idea of inclusion exclusion principle. Right, as essentially all of the counting that we've done in this class really just built upon these simple principles here. The idea of a combination and a permutation can be simply derived right, from these, from these uh, uh, initial principles, these, these basic principles. And so of course we have combinations and permutations. For many of the calculation problems, right, again, I'm not going to ask you to evaluate, you know, perform the actual computations you, that you would very likely want to use a calculator for. And, um, but I'm also not going to supply equations for combinations and permutations either. So if you, um, and so if there was a problem which asked, you know, how many more permutations are there than combinations, right, you can list your answer to that in, in form of combinations and permutations or CMP or exponential form. But you'd, you'd, you'd have to know sort of the basics, the, the basic equation of each of these as well. And you can very easily derive the basic equation of combination or permutation by simply looking at the product rule and inclusion exclusion as well. Right, so you should, you should know the equations to, the, to combination and permutations. Right. And as I noted before, and as you guys have seen when doing a lot of these examples and practice problems, it's best not to simply just memorize these equations because it's rare that you'll encounter a scenario where you can just blindly simply plug and play one of these equations. You generally have to break up a problem into a few sub-problems, do apply some of the counting rules to each of the sub-problems, and then recombine them using some sense of the product rule inclusion exclusion principle, which might then result in some sort of combination of 
the choose function and permutation functions. Yeah. And like you said, we don't have to know like eight to the eight factorial. Right, yeah. Now you can leave these things in factorial form, in exponential form, choose form, or permute form. All right, so we also covered the pigeonhole principle. Right, and more generally with respect to uh, counting, right, identify right, maybe the major distinctions, major categories of some of these counting problems, right, is repetition involved? Repetition allowed and a replacement. Right, do you have distinguishable or undistinguishable objects? Right. Repetition, right, distinguish, and does order matter? Right, again, when you go to evaluate a problem, you're going to want to identify these three main characteristics of the problem to help with how you're going to organize it, how you're going to break it apart, and how you, what sort of counting scheme you're going to apply. Right, as the counting becomes quite different if there's repetition versus if there's not, if the items are distinguishable, if they're not, right, if there's order, if there's not. Also remember, we did a few examples, changing perspective can help quite a bit when attacking some of the more complex problems. It can make a, a very difficult or cumbersome counting problem a lot more easy, but just by changing perspective. So practice some of those, those problems where changing perspective can really help. And we also have right, discrete or finite probability. And certainly be able to identify, define, characterize the basics, right? What is a sample space? Right. What is an event? Right. So whenever you're faced with a probability problem, you should always start off by answering these two questions. And as it can make a what seemingly a difficult question become quite clear and easy. And we define probability distributions. Right, you should know the basic right, right, the basic laws of probability distributions. Right, the additive nature of probability distributions. Right, the complements of events, right, the law of total probability. And we discussed conditional probability. Right, we also discussed the idea of independent events. Continue this list over here. Right. Discussed Bernoulli trials. And binomial trials. And binomial trials are just right, composed of some number of Bernoulli trials. Right. It's just a sequence of Bernoulli trials. And right. we discussed random variables. Once we were able to define the random variable, we were then also able to define expected values. So last and certainly not least, we also discussed Bayes' theorem. And then I 
idea of Bayesian updating. Right. And then very recently, we've discussed graphs and trees. I know the, the basic definitions. But I understand of course, you know that a graph is simply equal to, right, is defined as a set of vertices and edges. I know how the edges, right, are represented. I know the nomenclature. And what is what is a directed graph versus a non, you know, an undirected graph? What is a connected graph? And what are the nodes of a graph? And what's what's a simple graph? Right. right. Very likely in uh, in a section that might have to do with graphs and entries. Right. I may present you with a problem scenario which we can represent as a graph. I'll try to clearly identify what's going on and how we're using the graph to represent a particular problem. Right. And then I might ask you what sort of solution to this problem, or what it, what would a solution to this problem entail? Would it entail finding things something like a shortest path, an Euler path, uh, a Hamilton path, something of that nature? Right. There may also be a question where, if I were to supply some pseudocode, right, or an algorithm, a procedure for traversing a graph or or doing something with a graph, and then just being able to understand uh, the pseudocode for a graph and how uh, how to apply it to a graph when when a graph is provided as input. Right. Furthermore, you should also be able to, when looking at a graph or when looking at the pseudocode for a graph, you should be able to identify what the time complexity of that pseudocode might be in terms of n, the number of nodes, or e, the number of edges. Right. Again, this should be fairly clear if you're just simply looking at the pseudocode, right? and or if you apply some pseudocode to an example graph, you should be able to see if traversing the graph, how many times you might visit an edge, how many times you might visit a node. And therefore, you should be able to at least intuitively justify a time complexity estimate in terms of n, the number of nodes, or e, the number of edges. And again, so this is graphs, right? Trees. And right, we discussed trees here, right? No rooted trees. Right, no tree applications such as the binary search tree or game trees or search trees in general. And many of you use trees when we were doing our number theory stuff. Many, when you were asked to do the prime factorization, you sort of used the tree hierarchy, very intuitive application of a tree as well. Right. Understand right, uh, traversals. Right, you don't have to memorize the traversals. Right, what in order, or pre order, or post order would look like. Right, but I may supply pseudocode for one of these in order, pre order, or post order, and supply you with a tree, and then expect you what the the traversal might look like if there was a print statement in there, for example. So understand the traversals at least. Understand the concept of traversing a tree, though you need not memorize the pseudocode for each of the traversal types that we've discussed. Right. I think that is it. Any questions? The organization of the exam will be similar to our last exam. There will probably be five or so sections, and you'll be able to skip one of them. Okay. I'll see you guys on Monday. <laughs>